evening. Good evening. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program, a talk by Betsy Barlow Rogers on her latest book, Saving Central Park. I'm Carol Malone, Chair of the Board of Trustees, and one cannot overestimate the intrinsic part that Central Park has played in most of our lives, particularly in the lives of members of this library. I imagine that many of you visit the park regularly, and when you were children, before you went to school, you may even have been taken out to the park, not once, but twice a day, as I was. And um, this continues um, to happen. This, this tradition of going to the park continues, and it was brought home to me on Tuesday when I visited my almost two-year-old grandson, and uh, he really spoke for the first time. After his first word, which is bus, <laughs> uh, his first expression is, go to park, go to park. So uh, let's all go to park. And to do that, I'll introduce Betsy. Uh, Elizabeth Barlow Rogers is the president of the Foundation for Landscape Studies, a native of San Antonio, Texas. She earned a BA degree from Wellesley College and an MA in city planning from Yale University in 1964. In 1979, she was appointed Central Park Administrator the following year in order to bring citizen support to the restoration and management renewal of Central Park. She initiated the Central Park Conservancy, the nation's first public-private park partnership. Betsy led the Conservancy as president until 1996 when she founded the Cityscape Institute. In 2002, she created the Garden History and Landscape Studies curriculum at the Bard Graduate Center. And in 2005, she established the Foundation for Landscape Studies. As the owner with her husband, Theodore C. Rogers, of the C.L. Browning Ranch in Texas Hill Country, she oversees the enhancement of its natural beauty, ecological health, and educational value. And I should mention that Ted Rogers is a very valued member of our Board of Trustees. And I do encourage you to notice all of the marvelous upgrades to our website recently. Many of those are thanks to Ted and Betsy's generosity. Betsy is the writer of eight books on landscape design and, and also on the cultural meaning of place. Many of her books delve into the history of the green spaces in our city, from the days when it was a primeval forest to current times. Betsy is a life trustee of the Central Park Conservancy and a member of the boards of the Battery Conservancy and the Library of American Landscape History. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the advisory board of the National Association of Olmsted Parks, which as you know are across the country, and the Alana Partnership. She is an honorary member of the American Society of Landscape Architects, recipient of the Society's 2005 Lagasse Medal. In 2010, she received the Greenwood Historic Fund's DeWitt Clinton Award in Arts, Literature, Preservation, and Historic Research, and the Rockefeller Foundation's Jane Jacobs Medal for Lifetime Achievement. In 2012, she was honored with the Henry Hope Reed Award from the School of Architecture at the University of Notre Dame. And in 2013, the Preservation League of New York bestowed on her its Pillar of New York Award. In 2016, she received not only the New York Botanical Garden's rarely conferred gold medal, but also in that year, Betsy and Ted were joint recipients of the Century Association's Archives Foundation Medal, uh, all of which puts me in mind of the end of a uh, story by one of my favorite authors, the Edwardian H.H. Monroe, or Saki. Does anyone else? remember the stories of Saki. Mm -hmm. Well, at the end of one story, there's a girl who has won so many gold medals that a tiger swallows her up. <laughs> he hears them clinking. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I wanted to be very nonchalant with this introduction, as if every speaker that we introduce has won 12 gold medals and 13 citations and awards. But you know, it's really not the case. So we're very honored indeed that Betsy has come back to us for this evening. Thank you. Well, believe me, the medals, it's just a badge. And it's all to say.
Central Park. I'm a representative of the park. And it's this tremendous fund of love that all of you here, you wouldn't be here, and so many other people have for Central Park. So that's what the medals are all about, believe me. Um, and the book uh, is about the park itself. It really is, the park has had many lives, and I've been very blessed that uh, many years of my life have been in a with the fortunes of Central Park. So here we go. There it is. The great green rectangle. I can't tell you how many people say I don't know how I can live in New York without it. And I say the same thing. Look at the head nodding here in the room. Um, and I think we're in a golden age now. And it's not all because of me. It really is because the vision of the Conservancy succeeded and it has sustained uh, the park through a contract now with the city of New York. Uh, and some of the people that I hired over 30 years ago gave their whole professional lives to Central Park. Um, this is an aside, I'm rambling, but uh, I, I ran into one of the, um, the guys in the park in the field and the other day, and he, I, I recognized him, I said, where are you from? He, Cambodia, he was a summer intern, this, a refugee from the Khmer Rouge, and we hired, I think, 13 of them out of Martin Luther King High School as summer interns, and then some got regular jobs. So it's that kind of effort that has resulted in what I get to see on my morning walk, and you do too, because I'm sure many of you walk in the same, or you have your own territories in Central Park, this is <laughs> and, and oh, this is actually where that nice photograph that Annie Leibovitz took of me is by this great rock, and I'm very, um, I really think the rocks in Central Park, these great big rock outcrops are so marvelous and essential to its beauty. And bird watching is, oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> did you see the curve before? Well, of course you did. <laughs> and um, th this is the season. And uh, it, it really is a, a miracle that uh, we have on the Atlantic Flyway all of these beautiful birds coming in. And the part, though, I'm going to tell you, it looks, it's, it, it is nature, but it's really all man-made. It is the most brilliant 19th century engineering infrastructure overlaid with a picturesque, naturalistic landscape. So some of those bedrock outcrops were left. Others were, it was like a quarry. They blasted away. You still see some of the, the grooves where the dynamite sticks, you know, were inserted. And then the rocks were used. There were no streams in Central Park. This is all man-made. The reservoir water supplies of uh, the reservoir that we know today is the new reservoir that was built when the park was built. The old reservoir right on the site of the Great Lawn. Here we have this construction, all of it of the lakes and ponds, and there's the morning walk continuing. Here is, um, <coughs> you know, you'll see this scene every Sunday in Central Park, some weekdays too, and here is the heart of the park, of course, the beautiful Bethesda Terrace and the Conservatory Garden, which is just thrown over the crab out blossoms, but it is just a marvelous and beautiful thing. I think Lyndon Miller is probably also very active in this library, and she's the one that I said, please, she's an artist and a gardener, please leave your studio for a year and help me um, restore this, you know, really terribly neglected garden. And as they say, the rest is history for public gardening career. Okay, I mentioned how the, the whole park it's this Manhattan schist. It's the fabric of the park. And you have the Belvedere. The Belvedere, uh, notice how it's made out of this Vista Rock. And the, the, the same schist that was being quarried in the park makes the building stones 
of the Belvedere. And here is another happy scene. This is the Great Lawn, and it didn't always look like that. So I said, who was born before 1960 and not in the ends? <laughs> so um, anyway, this is what it looked like. And this is what I just showed you, the Belvedere covered with graffiti, abandoned. There's the Great Lawn, I mean, excuse me, the Sheep Meadow, also a dust bowl like the Great Lawn. Here is the Sheep Meadow. I think some weeds, when they, they greened up a little bit, but they're all weeds, just the, the, the blade of grass. Right? And those are the Hampshire ball fields down in the south end of the park, all eroded, everywhere erosion. You have the you know, tree roots exposed, all of that soil mm -hmm. uh, eroding, filling the drains. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, that was the park. <clears throat> Here was a burned down boathouse at the north end. At the, you, you weren't supposed to go north of 96th Street. It's unsafe, remember? It's dangerous. And this was the boathouse at the Harlem Mere, and it had become a vandalized ruin. All the copper roof had been stolen, and the thing had been set on fire. The Harlem Mere itself was like this, and you had. You see floating around, see those oil drums? Those were the litter receptacles that they used back then. Here is the erosion. This is the beautiful Bethesda that we saw a moment ago, the Bethesda Terrace, the coping stones, all broken, all that erosion is pushing. Uh, and the vandals were helping out too. Uh, and the graffiti. Everywhere we have. Uh, graffiti that's back in the conservatory garden now and here is a, what's now called the Rumsey Playfield and here is back on the Great Lawn this is when the mass concerts of uh, the concerts the Conservancy has a it, it's really brilliant now you know the way in which they're managed and you don't want to just kill all the concerts, certainly you want to keep the Philharmonic and coming to get their summer concerts, and you want to have the occasional, you know, pop concert. And so, uh, but it has to be managed, and boy, it was not managed back then. Mm -hmm. And I said the park has had <clears throat> many lives, and so this book is called A History and a memoir. So while I'm part of this last generation of its history, you really can't appreciate the park without knowing about how it has gone. I call, I use that word palimpsest, you know, it's layer upon layer. And here, it was the civic wheel. I mean, you had the uh, William Cullen Bryant, who was the editor of the New York Post, and you had Andrew Jackson Downing, the Hudson River Valley uh, great landscape uh, designer and nurseryman, horticulturist, uh, who died young. He might have been the one to have designed the park, uh, but that didn't happen. Instead, they had a design competition, uh, and uh, Frederick Longstead and Calvert Fox submitted the winding entry, which is called the Green Sword Plan, and this is what they have. <laughs> this was the ragged fringe of the city. The city was still mostly below 42nd Street, and this was kind of a no man's land. 
Uh, it had squatters, of course. It had it did have a settlement called Seneca Village. Uh, it had bone boiling works. Uh, that's where all the carcasses of the animal. You just think of a city with no motor vehicles, but all you know horse-drawn carriages, and then you had you know the oval from the butchers. Of, you know, we won't go in and get too disgusting to talk about. But there you had, they would boil the bones and make buttons and things like that, I think. Um, and this is the green sword plan, and this is the design that has um, governed uh, the park throughout its, its life. This is the park, uh, but not as the way we know it today. Uh, it, was created, as I said, totally man-made. Bringing back the Queen's work plan, you'll see. This is, this is, you can't replicate history. You can't go all the way back. But the spirit of it, the scenery of the park, is the principle that we uh, fought for. Uh, so here the park is under construction. I mentioned this brilliant uh, 19th century engineering technology and all of the water bodies being created, the marshy areas <coughs> being excavated, and the, um, um, I'm losing my words, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's the boat bridge in the background, and the lake, uh, which is totally man-made. And the whole idea, they use the expression Bruce in there, the meaning country and the city, you were meant to feel that you were actually out in the countryside. And the sheep met up, Robert Moses. Let's get to Moses in a moment and how the sheep got eliminated. <laughs> um, you had the um, um, rustic gazebos and rustic bridges. Uh, th this is a vocabulary of construction that we did bring back. Uh, and you see those rustic railings now and rustic arbors. This was torn down. That's where the Chess and Checkers house is today. And uh, the idea was, of course, you would have viewing the rocks, you would get on top with, and there would usually be this kind of lookout, and like the rustic summer house I just showed you. And so it's about scenery, it's about the views, and it's really about movement, moving through this landscape. And what's really amazing is that they created a circulation system where there was no intersection between different modes of movement through the park. So you had the pedestrians being carried over the bridal trail <coughs> on these beautiful cast iron bridges and under the carriage drives through these very handsome stone arches. And you have what the most amazing of all, the first example of great separation of traffic with the sunken transverse roads. So the design competition called for four roads, east-west traffic, to allow that to go across the park. And that would have made essentially five parks because it would have broken it up. And so they almost dead in the box. Sunken transverse roads. Here's the Manhattan shifts, you know, again, the big blocks, you know, forming the embankments. And today, you're, you're hardly aware of them. They're there, and you never feel the presence. You will hear the, you know, a little bit of traffic noise, but not much. And I, the park is never finished, of course. No landscape ever is. But you can say around 1873, I think is when we, um, <clears throat> nobody declared it was finished, but it looked like this. And so this is the implementation of that Greensward plan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> and uh, what happened is, and, and you have to really realize that landscapes are, and this book is about cultural history as much as it is about uh, design. And the ethos of recreation, 
I've been talking about scene, and I've been talking about the importance of bringing back the beauty of Central Park and, and the scenic qualities that it had. However, uh, recreation, physical recreation, was very important at the turn of the century, and so the idea that you would have um, people could play ball, they could begin to, you had lawn tennis even and things like that, but it really, um, there, there were some really cuckoo uh, proposals to do a racetrack, to do an aerodrome, to do this, to do that, I mean, you know, the attitude toward the park. There was no, you know, preservation ethos, and it survived all of that, and so here it does welcome you know, some athletic uh, facilities, but this is the guy who really facilitates recreation with construction. Before you've been allowed to use the meadow and, uh, and all of that, but he turned them into uh, designated ball fields. My editor is a ball player for her team at Knopf for many years. And so I have to be very careful about saying too many bad things about the ball fields. And certainly we didn't choose to, to remove any ball fields. I mean, that would have been terrible. People want to play ball, it's a good thing. But how do you make, you know, that grassy landscape, the outfields grassy, or how do you make it look? like it's really part of the rest of the park. That was the challenge. And in 1934, you read Bob Carroll's book, there's a chapter called 1934, and 19 playgrounds, and they're all, you know, it's like a stamp, you know, they're all circular, and they all have those iron paintings of fences around it. And here's a conservatory garden, he tore down the conservatory um, which was where plants were propagated and also began, like New York Botanical Garden, a um, conservatory for display of plants. Uh, but it was probably uh, very old by that time. He did not choose to keep it or renovate it, but, uh, and who's to say that conservatory garden isn't really wonderful, but it is an old study and it's a very formal insert into the park. But, that's one that we really love, and here's the zoo. And he built this zoo, uh, which then was replaced when the New York um, Wildlife Conservation Society, the Bronx Zoo people, took over. And, but here it is, under construction. I mean, just immediately after he becomes um, commissioner. And this is later, it's in the 50s. And he was a good fundraiser. He uh, got Kate Woolman's lawyer to him aside and wanted, always there was, and you see these career and Ives uh, prints of alfresco skating on the pond, whenever the pond would freeze, which was much more frequent then than it does now in, in the lake. Uh, you would have ice skating and Moses wanted to put a brick, a regular, uh, rink, and you could use it, of course, more days of the year. And it's a happy sight. And Donald Trump, after the <laughs> park department, really stubbed its toe and couldn't uh, rebuild the rink. And I won't go into the, you know, horrible way that capital project <laughs> was a fiasco, but he, Trump, Trump did uh, restore this rink that was built on Moses in the 50s. Here, Moses put in parking lots. This had been the carriage turnaround for horses. That had been the, um, is still now, the, the fountain, the Cherry Hill fountain, where uh, the horses could drink. So uh, the carriages now still come up, the horse-drawn carriages for the tourists. Uh, but the park, uh, the cars are gone, and this is restored, and the fountain is restored. And then, um, we have the, I call it the Anything Goes era, and I think you all remember this gentleman, and uh, it was a very spirited uh, period in the life of the park. You, uh, it was, the whole society was changing radically, and as I said earlier, uh, this is about cultural values, and certainly, the upheaval that
that we as a society experienced in the 60s and the 70s uh, was manifest in the work that was really helped along by Tom Hoving. And you had, um, that's a sheet meadow, you know, Barbara Streisand, everyone remembers that. Oh, it was great. And it was. But there was the sheet meadow, you know, just bare and there was no way of managing any of the concerts, and there were many. And here you had the protest marches, you had the happenings, the be-ins. <laughs> <laughs> this is not my photograph. I have a lot of photographs. But the last two are by the great photographer, Gary Winogrand. And he, uh, I saw this at the Metropolitan Museum uh, in the photography show, and I thought, well, that sums it up. <laughs> and so, uh, we were able to obtain the rights to publish that. And there is Pollyanna. <laughs> and I think my daughter took that picture, I believe. Uh, and there I am. And this was a really happy time in my life. And I'm out there weeding with my teenagers. Now, how did that happen? A lot of you remember, um, probably, Adele Auchincloss, the wife of Louis Auchincloss. And, Adele was a young party like me, and, and we got to know each other. The civic group called the Park Association, which now is called New Yorkers for Parks, uh, we met and became good friends. And so when um, uh, a Beam, uh, whose name doesn't resonate in history, mayor, <laughs> uh, right after John Lindsay in the city was in, dire fiscal crisis, and uh, he appointed uh, somebody who'd given him a handsome campaign gift as a party, I call him the Playboy Commissioner, uh, and uh, he would go to parties and invite this one and that one, and so there is dear Odell sitting as a deputy commissioner, and you know, no job description at all, but Adele uh, has wonderful connections with Brooke Astor and Iphigene Salzburger, and um, it was wonderful because Brooke gave a grant, the first grant, you know, for the Central Park Task Force. And the idea, this is where, uh, even before me, the notion was that you could have a plan to restore uh, the park. Uh, and then they had some, well, Ivogen gave uh, money for the um, summer intern program. So here they are, these are the kids. What I knew about Olmsted, I'd written a book about Olmsted uh, in 72, which whether it's a long essay or a short book, it went with an exhibition. This is just the beginning of the revival of Olmsted's rep reputation. The Whitney Museum had an exhibition and I you know, was the writer of the catalog. And so Adele thought that that qualified me, so here I am with all my knowledge about park history and homestead and scenery, and these are my kids right off the streets of New York, and it was really, it was wonderful. You know, we got them <laughs> into, I, I, I really uh, failed management 101, <laughs> but I, I learned on the job, and here they are, and uh, we're dredging, this is up in the lot, which is there in the north end of the park, and it was cool down in the spring bed, so we did that. And we had a poetry uh, seminar, not a seminar, just, you know, kids writing poetry. And, uh, and, and we also had a photography program. We had those little um, cardboard camera things that, um, I forget what it was called. Uh, and so poetry and photography. And uh, here are the St. Bernard's boys. Uh, they are um, our volunteers. I was working with um, his name, Vernon Gray, a teacher, science teacher there, and so we've got the kids out and we planted. And then, Koch is elected and Gordon Davis is appointed his first park commissioner. Gordon sees um, this little stuff going on in the park that I'm doing and um, he had a little office I managed to get in the um, arsenal in the park department. So I'm already, you know, with a foot in the door. And Gordon then uh, is trying to clean out the dead wood. The park department 
first of all, the workforce out in the field is demoralized, but then in the department itself, it, I call it the dead wood, I mean, if, if uh, the patronage jobs, if somebody at City Hall had a mistress, you would send her off and give her a job mm -hmm. works. <laughs> and and on and on. So uh, he is trying to build an administration. And so he sees what I'm doing and he realizes that it's very important to decentralize management and that you need people that are responsible for specific parts of the park system. So he said, would you like to be in charge of something park? Wow. Uh, and so I <laughs> said, yes. He said, what shall we call it? We said, Central Park Administrator. Now, a year later, Prospect Park got an administrator. We got borough commissioners. And that uh, began to make a difference. But I got no budget. And I knew that what was really critical and important and going to me a lot and then meeting Bill Beinecke, who was just stepping down from being the CEO of his family company, s &H Green Stamps agreed to be our chairman. And Bill had connections, uh, not only within the philanthropic <coughs> world, but also uh, within the world of corporate America. So he began to help build a board. I knew we had to have a board. I said, you know, it's very bold. You know, it has to be a board, not the American Museum of Natural History or the New York Botanical Garden if you're going to raise serious money and really this little task force I had support. And I was learning, instead of writing books to my grant proposals, <laughs> here um, is um, the uh, beginning of uh, where I'm being appointed. So now I have this official position, <laughs> and we decided it's going to be Central Park uh, Administrator. I'm not really petting Ed Koch. <laughs> <laughs> and the most important thing is after we, we start building, oh, I forgot to tell you about building the board. There, he said there's this young CEO who's just arrived in New York, and I think he would be great. He's a runner, and he really likes Central Park. I want you to meet Ted Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> so Ted was a, a board member until he proposed to me, and then he had to resign from the back. Uh, so the board's loss was my gain. Uh, anyway, it was a gain all the way around, because for, for many, many years, uh, you know, we, we really are lucky when we have uh, our best advisors close at hand. So through all these years, <laughs> to have an advisor at the dinner table, uh, for me, has been a great blessing. And the other thing that was very important was, is still, to have a plan. You must have a plan. And the term that everybody used, master plan, that's fine, but we always termed ours a management and restoration plan and put the word management first because you really can't restore anything shown. I mean, if you're not going to manage it. So managing. Getting 50,000 square feet of graffiti removed. We got a graffiti crew. We got a bonds conservation crew, a planning crew, a um, tree crew. And uh, this was really important. The most important, uh, and I'll tell you about that later, is the zone owners, because we're keeping on decentralizing. Just as Gordon's decentralizing management responsibility, so in the park, uh, I believed in decentralizing these management responsibilities. So you have the overall turf crew, tree crew, et cetera, but then you have the, uh, and that's why the park feels so safe and, and each zone starting with actually the strawberry fields with Yoko Ono's gift that allowed us to create an endowment for his own gardener as well as restore strawberry fields. Okay, the, the most um, significant symbol, I think this was very symbolic, was the Bethesda Fountain because the Bethesda Fountain is right in the heart of the park. It is the, the, the one grand feature. You have the mall and you 
dropped down to the Bethesda Terrace, and there's the fountain, and then it melts back into nature. There's the ramble on the other shore, and restoring that was very important. I showed you that all that broken coping stone, the erosion and pushed down, and uh, the broken, the graffiti uh, stonework there. You can see how the birds' heads, they had all been knocked off, and we had a sculpture work, and we were able to replace the, uh, you know, some of this gorgeous ornamental stonework. And up in the north end, uh, this happened not immediately, but we always said, people would say, what are the most important projects you have? And I said, well, the heart of the park is Bethesda. And then I said, the north end, it's really important. People said, 96th Street, you know, that's the line, you know, across it. And I said, we do this. Park goes to 110th Street. So uh, that had to wait until we got the mere dredge and uh, the gift from the Charles A. Dana Foundation to build this wonderful environmental center uh, in the north end. And uh, look, I mean, I'm very proud. We have another thing. Architects will maybe just put a building, you know, they have a site, put a building. Well, no, you have to work with your landscape architect. So it's signing the building, and I really love the way that uh, our team of landscape architects and the conservancy worked with Sam White of Butcher White Implements, and this is the result. And now, I am frequent, I was frequently called an elitist. I mean, really, a lot. <laughs> and <laughs> this is not a West Side audience, uh, like the one we had at Barnes & Noble, which was a wonderful, wonderful audience, too, and passionate because they also just care so much about the park. But really, uh, the symbol of that the rich people are taking over the park, I'm the symbol of that. And so, forget it. The <laughs> best thing, the best thing that happened to Central Park was I wanted to give a benefit, and I knew that I wasn't really a socialite, and how was I going to organize a luncheon, and I was really lucky because I found um, Norma Dana and Phyllis Wagner, Jean Clark, Mark Bell, Maggie Purnell, and they formed the Women's Committee. And my mother was behind me, and my mother was a real presser, and she says, you must look Bart. And so, <laughs> she sent me beautiful clothes and it gave me her designer dresses, her hand me downs. And uh, then Gordon leaves, and here um, are the rich people and the elitists and me, and, and Gordon inherits, uh, the, I mean, excuse me, um, Henry Stern in, inherits the conservancy that had been formed in the prior administration by. Gordon. So we have to form a relationship, Henry and I, and it became a long relationship because he served uh, under, in two mayoral administrations, uh, in uh, Koch's, the rest of Koch's term, and also in the Giuliani administration. So um, it was a relationship that, it is a friendship. It's like an old marriage lots of marital spats, but it really <laughs> is enduring. And there is Henry, there is uh, Ed Koch, and me were walking along the Great Long. And later, we have Ira Milstein, becomes our third chairman. We have Bill Weinke, then James Evans, another retiring CEO. Uh, and in those days, you know, 65 seems really young to me now. And uh, that 65 was retirement age, and if you got somebody who was really, look at the head smiling over there, that was experienced uh, in management in corporate America and had good connections and, and uh, generous friends, that was great. So uh, the third gentleman is Ira Milstein, and he's a lawyer, and he then looks at me, and this was like my mother. You know, again, this is generational. I mean, people who are living out of wedlock, you know, they were shacked up or living without benefit of clergy. And so <laughs> Ira looks at me and he says, you mean you're doing all of this just on a handshake? And 
We were. I mean, that was, we had warmed our way into the park department, and it was a thriving public-private partnership, and we were raising money, which gave us some, you know, a bit more status and power. Uh, but we had no contract with the city, so, uh, and that really took a long time, but Ira was great negotiating that contract. Uh, and finally, and this was actually a couple of years after I left, the formal contract that the Conservancy raises the money to run Central Park, it does get a cut of the concession revenues. Finally, the revenues go to the general fund, but the Conservancy gets part of, of that. And so that was a wonderful thing that he did, and Mike Bloomberg uh, was always wonderful. He was a trustee, and then later, as mayor, he uh, did many good things for the parks of the city. Now, um, I'm going to see if I can do this. Um, you know, uh, scenery, I keep going back to this beautiful 19th century scenery and how much we're trying to restore that and make the Robert Moses facilities and the scenery, you know, blend together better. And <laughs> this is here. Pass, pass it around if you can. <laughs> can you look through? This is a stereopticon, and it's a cheesy, you know, ordered online version. But uh, so it's faux antique, and <laughs> you, can look, and you can see they're supposed to be, you know, your binocular vision. You know, you're supposed to see those two images, and they merge and look as if you're looking at three dimensions. And that's my way of saying that the park really, really is, uh, a lot of it is about scenic space. So when I said that we had marital spats in Rita and I, I don't want to dwell on that because we, uh, you know, it, it truly is friendship. My relationship, I'm gonna read you uh, just a little bit about it, uh, with Henry deserves further analysis for it strikes at the very heart of the nature of public-private partnerships, the fundamental basis of this special kind of institution lies in the necessary division of power between a public agency and a private organization. Accord and cooperation are implicit in the word partnership. And this alliance is weakened if harmony is breached too often. Power is a matter of authority and there are two ways to gain it. It can either be conferred or won. In Henry's case, it was conferred by the mayor. In mine, it had to be won by public endorsement of the Conservancy's vision to rebuild Central Park. Here is precisely where the friction lay. As the Commissioner of Parks, Henry was my boss as far as my role as Park Commissioner. My city position was concerned. You'll see I'm not very good employee material. But anyway, uh, however, my presidency of the Conservancy, along with the fact that this private organization paid my salary, gave me a degree of autonomy. Autonomy, however, is not the same thing as authority. Because municipal parks, this is an important point, because municipal parks are public property, authority rightfully belongs to the mayor and the park commissioner. Thus, within the terms of the public-private partnership, the city's power is preeminent. For me, this meant that implementation of the elements of the plan that the Conservancy wished to undertake as private funds became available had to be enforced by Henry. And so he's a Moses guy, and, and, and he's, he's political, and I'm an esthete, or not only an elitist, an esthete. <laughs> about scenery and, and beauty. And, and here is the bad <laughs> shell that has, was put in to the park by Elkin Nelberg, and this was back much before Moses' time. And uh, it was, this is actually 34, Moses was you know, just taking office. But wonderful, wonderful summer evenings. If you read E.B. White's here in New York, you know, you'll see the mood of that place, and it was, it was, it was wonderful. But by the time this thing was shabby and broken and covered with graffiti and the 
wisteria pergola. We have just restored that. You can't even see it. It's you know behind the band shell, and uh, it was a hideout for drug dealers back there. And uh, so we wanted to put the music stand where the old music stand had been, build a new one, uh, and remove the band shell. And the Nelberg family didn't feel happy, but they agreed, and we had a beautiful memorial, you know. Sculpture designed and granite to commemorate. And then uh, landmarks approved it, said it's not had some, you know, valuable, it's concrete uh, a piece of Beaux Arts architecture. So we were ready to push that through. And then uh, all hell broke loose, and uh, a young relative, now the relative, uh, decided that this was his cause in life to keep the band shell. And you remember the pink paper, the observer? Well, he had a good <laughs> mouthpiece there, and he managed and finally bring us to court. I mean, it was, it was really a nightmare. And Henry stayed right on the fence, you know, because he's a political <laughs> cat, and he, you know, he's just gonna let it play itself out and play itself out it did. But the park is big, and there were lots of landscapes, and as I say, it didn't during friendship, but uh, we did. The park was getting restored in spite of two big fights, and that was the band shell and the tennis house. And so I do feel that this can't just be a book all about a big success story. I wanted to tell uh, the story of, you know, the troubled water, since I think I call that chapter. And then, uh, at the end, uh, I call the last chapter, Saffron Celebration. And that's because of the um, gates. Now, Crystal and Jean-Claude had come to see, when Gordon had just uh, taken uh, over as, as park commissioner, even one, I think. He was appointed in, well, see, I was appointed in 79. I guess he came in with Koch in 78. And then, I think it was 19, maybe it was 80, anyway. Christo and Jean-Claude came in, and we wrote a report. Gordon authored it, and I contributed a lot to it. And it was you know, big uh, legal uh, document that said that the park itself is the work of art, and that we don't want to impose on it anymore. It's not just there. Uh, it's had all of these damages from all of the activities that have gone on. And, but, uh, Jean-Claude and Crystal were very tenacious. And, uh, and in fact, they raised the money, all the money themselves, from the drawings so all of the years. And then she said to me later, Betsy, we did not have the money in the beginning, and they didn't. And so anyway, it was fine. When it came 25 years later, I was so pleased because it was like an anniversary gift to the Central Park Conservancy. And it was so wonderful to see, and what I tell, is in this book um, is how the gates were manufactured, how they went up, and how my successor, Doug Blonsky, worked with Vince Davenport, who knows Vince Davenport, Chris, all of the Crystal projects, one in Vince, the engineer behind them all is Vince. So Vince and Doug worked together. And so this whole fabrication of the gate and installation and recruiting of all of those volunteers and with Christo groupies, you know, that worked on other projects. And how that was uh, brought about was, it was really terrific to watch. And that's the story I tell. And here it was wonderful, uh, all the days of the, uh, the three weeks. And I was in the park practically every one of those days and all the different weathers, it was great. And then here's the way I end my book. The 16-day mass event could perhaps be thought of as a nostalgia-inspiring throwback to the period of its genesis more than 25 years earlier. Yet there were, yet there were differences. The era of cultural unrest that had swept the country during the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War was over. Mass events in the park in the 60s and early 70s were hardly polite. Unlike the long trampling crowds 
that attended the happenings of the period, further destroying the park's already severely bruised landscape. Those who came to see the gates in 2005 seldom strayed from the past, nor were the mass events of the 1970s even by a small fraction as well orchestrated and managed as this one. By the third week in March, not long after the gates had been dismantled and was just an extraordinary memory, an erased inscription on the park's ever-evolving palimpsest, another event was set in motion. This time it was a universally welcomed annual one, the coming of spring. One could see the saffron stigmas in the center of the opening crocuses. <laughs> Identify it, please. Yellow warbler. Yeah. Yellow warbler. There you are. Um, and, uh, and there's a you know, touch of saffron, you see, and the blossoms there. And uh, so the saffron really didn't go away from the park. Um, and the fall, of course, brings lots of, of saffron color to the park. Um, and one could see the saffron stigmas in the center of the opening crocuses and on an upper window pediment just below the sheltering cornice of an apartment building on Fifth Avenue and 74th Street after a contentious squabble. This wasn't my squabble, this was the building squabble. After a contentious squabble precipitated by the removal and then under intense public pressure reinstallation of the supports for their tweedy nest. A famous pair of red-tailed hawks was again in residence. A telescope trained on the nest presented the spectacle of the male bird's dusky, orange-tinged tail feathers as he soared to a landing with food for his mate. There's a bit of orange I threw in, sort of orange, <laughs> uh, because uh, this is the, um, the most beloved monument in Central Park. It's just not a brass statue or sculpture. It's the strawberry fields. Uh, memorial to John Lennon. And over and over, I heard people say, I was glad to see them come and glad to see them go, speaking of the gates. Often they added, it was Good, it's good to have the park back. On March 27th, Easter Sunday, Central Park was as thronged with visitors as it had been on every day when the gates was on view. I was one of them, and I too was glad to have the park back as if it had ever gone away. <laughs> Many, many things 
works have been proposed as encroachment, and it was impossible to, uh, again, what, this was not a big fight, but it was a, a pushback, and some of us really felt that we were just starting to restore the park, and that at least there should be a welcoming park entrance, you know, like Richard Morris Hunt had designed. That was the first enlargement, you know, you had Boxes building, and then you had the big Beaux-Arts building with the facade on Fifth Avenue that we know, and then you have, of course, the um, additions that were um, designed in the 80s, and Kevin Williams, that's the name I'm searching for, the architect. And we said, there's a letter that's probably as good as the paper it's written on, that there will be no more in you know, so the permit was given, but it was agreed that this was it, that the Metropolitan Museum had established a footprint and no more. Well, there will be proposals under the new director. Who knows what's going to happen with a new wing of modern art, or, but you're right to feel the way that you do. But it's a hard one. It really is. It's easier to protest a lot of encroachments, but the fact is that they did establish that piece of the park as their territory. Yes? I was surprised uh, to read in uh, one of the great reviews on your book that the park deteriorated in the end of the 19th century, going into the 1920s, so that by the time Moses came, it wasn't like he was you know, de desecrating you know, a wonderful resource. How did that happen? What, 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 what was the, uh, the, uh, the mind of the city to allow well, the park to deteriorate? Yeah, what happened? You're talking about the early uh, 19, uh, 1900s. Like 1890 to, you know, 19, 1934. 1934, when right. Moses comes, right. that period. Yeah, well, that is, remember, it's a progressive movement. And so down on the Lower East Side, the idea that you would take and make playgrounds for children, and then you would bring people, it was a civilizing influence. I mean, this is American assimilation, you know, into the culture and recreation is considered, you know, one avenue toward um, improving life for kids and bringing them into the larger society. And so you have the use of the park and you have no administrative con conception within the park, you know, department itself. It, it was now a park department, it was no longer the board of commissioners ran it as it had been in the Days, the first early um, 18th, 18, up to when Boss Tweed took over in the 1870s. Anyway, uh, these commissioners, they didn't have any policy at all. And this is when the most horrendous uh, proposals were made, including it was an effort to raise money for war bonds for World War One to replicate the trenches of Verdun. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, to build an aerodrome to do this and that. Fortunately, those <coughs> things didn't happen. But nobody cared, really, about the park as park. And then Moses, what he did do was, uh, you know, boom, 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 brought in his recreation facility, but also brought in really strong management structure. So, you know, you remember the keep off the grass sign, very different kind of management than we have today. Remember those little things that he this way, and keep off the grass and all of that. So he had gardeners, I mean, they, they were there. They were gone by the time uh, the little Central Park Task Force started pulling up the weeds. Uh, and the um, park, uh, it survived, but it was also this change in the, as I said, the cultural ethos that was going toward recreation. And then uh, the Depression, think of how great it was to have, um, you know, not only talking movies, but also to have a park that as a playground for the people. Oh. Is that answer? Yes, question? absolutely. Okay. Yes. Um, one quick and one not so quick. 
Uh, one, one, right? one quick and one not so quick. The quick one is where was the Hooverville during the Depression? The not so quick is what do you see as the biggest challenge facing the park now? Okay, well, two questions, a double header. So, uh, Hooversville is where, what happened, this, we've just mentioned the Depression, that's what brought it to mind. And uh, Hooversville, which is, you know, shanties, homeless people, uh, building little shacks or whatever, uh, on the, uh, what had happened with the Great Lawn is today, they'd taken the old reservoir, remember I mentioned the central reservoir was a rectangular reservoir, and not the reservoir that was built at the time the park was built. And so that had been already decommissioned, and it had been, I think, some soil had been put in. Anyway, it was still rough, though. It didn't have any design, uh, and so it was Hooverstone. I mean, that was just the place where they camped out. And then <coughs> there's Robert Moses, and so we get uh, the Great Lawn, and it's designed by uh, Gilmore Clark. Of the, by this time, the landscape architects are not thinking picturesque scenery. They're thinking those are, you know, kind of spaces, and so you've got the oval. And um, I won't go any more on about design anyway. So the Great Lawn is where it was. To answer your question, and then I think I better take another question. Then we'll get back to the future of Central Park. Yes. Um, what do you think is the most compelling drama of the history of Central Park? The most, the most compelling drama of the history of Central Park. Would it be Olmsted and Vox's tensions or the 1970s? But what is sort of like if you were to watch this movie, what would you hope to see of the, the story? The most dramatic? Yeah. Um, well, you know, people always want to know the secrets of Central Park. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not a movie maker, so I'm a movie producer. Um, but I guess, you know, what I thought was pretty dramatic, again, it was another thing. Oh, Bill Dean isn't here. He, he, he you know, was fighting uh, this too. Tom Hovey wanted to put a um, polo field where the Great Lawn is. <laughs> and he wanted to build a stadium, you know, right there uh, where the, um, you have on the sunken transverse road where you have buildings by box that are occupied by the police. Well, he was going to build great underground um, stables for the horses, the police horses, but also have a polo play where the great lawn is. That was his, his plan. And so that's a good one, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> What's the most uh, horrible thing? Uh, yes. A uh, question about security. Uh, growing up, the, uh, the, the expression was, well, we don't go in Central Park after dark. Did you, your strategy and plan, did it have a specific security component, or did the park just benefit from the changes in the city overall? Yeah, well, you, you can read about this again. You know, this, this, is, um, this is a story in which, um, you know, we're living through, well, we're living through the AIDS epidemic, which is, you know, that affected uh, the life of the city and certainly Central Park, but uh, the jogger, the Central Park jogger incident, that occurred on my watch. And so uh, we had, first of all, I, I mentioned just in passing, and I didn't dwell on this enough, we were putting together, you know, the zone management system, and now Doug Blonsky, my successor, the best park manager in America, who's just retired from being the president and CEO of the Conservancy, every part of the park had a song. And it's, it's so much that was managed and, and, and looks beautiful and has you know, ground covers and green trees and it looks nice. And uh, back then, though, uh, it was happening. But it's still up in the ravine there where the lock is. Uh, it, it is perfectly safe now. I mean, perfectly safe. But then she was dragged off the 102nd Street transverse. And, and it, it was a, you know, it just rocked the city. 
uh, and the um, we have a, um, a blue ribbon panel, security panel, uh, and then Ira Milstein, I showed you Ira a moment ago, who uh, was the one who really pushed the contract of the city forward. One Ira uh, had uh, he before he became the the um, <clears throat> chairman of the conservancy, he uh, headed up a North End task force, and so restoring, again, another Moses recreational facility up there uh, in the North Meadow, where the North Meadow ball fields are, and, you know, making it better for recreation, and, you know, really reaching out to the youth in Harlem and trying to make those kind of improvements uh, was important. But ultimately, it was just I keep using that word management and restoration. When it when it looked good, it felt good. And people started, I mean, nobody hesitates to take a walk uh, in the ravine and, and through that block, as it's called, the stream that runs through it. Should we take one more? One more, I'm babbling on again. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> My favorite subject, yes. Last question. Yes, yes. you that um, you're going to have a stable in the park somewhere near the zoo. Is there going to be a stable in the park? No. The, 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 you mean the one that de Blasio uh, proposed? I, I think that that was, no, there was a proposal for the, the we don't want to get into that. Some real estate where the horses are now stable, those tourists you know, carriage horses that are down, that you see them in 59th Street at that entrance to the park. Well, there was some deal that he was making with the people who wanted that property. And so he said, well, we can stable them up in Central Park. Well, that didn't fly. That was good. And then he's done one remarkably wonderful thing, and that is now the park is closed to traffic all the time. I mean, that was just, First, in Lindsay administration, getting it for the weekends, getting, you know, a bit and a bit and a bit and a bit. And now, um, no traffic in Central Park. It's great. Do they have time for the future park? Oh, the future of the park? Well, no, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, <laughs> and, no, all I can say, and this, this is really uh, the message uh, that I, I want to leave everybody with, and that is, I said, the park has had many lives, and the park has gone up, it's gone down, and it does reflect the, um, the wishes, really, of the body politic, of the citizens of New York. And I think we have brought it to beyond my wildest dreams, really beyond my wildest dreams, to a state where stewardship is really the key to the future, and people loving the park and doing you know, funding the, the Central Park Conservancy, the Conservancy staying strong as the stewards of Central Park, along with the city, uh, I hope, I pray. We don't know. We never can tell the future, but I hope that we never have a dark age again. <laughs>